Good evening, everyone. I feel the the urge to explain a little something to everyone. Uh, you should have received an email about a change in the services here in a few weeks during Faith Builders. Um, it, <laughs> you know, there are, there are problems that we have in life that everybody thinks something ought to change and nobody does anything about it. I've heard a lot of people talk about our service times and all this here at the church. And, um, you know, we, we, ought to, we ought to start going earlier. We ought to do this. We ought to move the evening service. We ought to do, but, no, you know, we've never done anything. And so now uh, our situation with our speakers has necessitated the change. And this is not a permanent change. This is a one Sunday change. However, if it's something that everybody likes, there's no reason why we couldn't go to a similar type schedule at another time. Um, but we are going to have a 9.30 worship service and an 11 o'clock start our Bible classes. That'll give us a little bit of time to run over with the worship service, time for people to visit uh, before class starts at 11, and 45 minutes after class starts, we'll ring the bells, and we'll actually get out earlier than we normally do. Uh, our uh, Two of our guys who are helping with the worship service, our preacher, and the one that's doing the communion meditation, both of them have a flight at 125. And if we went on our regular schedule, they would either miss their flight or not be able to participate in our service, and we, we hate to miss out on the opportunity for these brothers to, to share with us in the service. So we're making this switch. We're going to be sending the email out as a reminder, and we're going to be announcing and, and trying to keep everybody current on the time schedule just to make sure that... Um, we, we communicate with everyone effectively. Um, you know, sometimes change is good. Sometimes change disrupts our and upsets the apple cart. And um, hopefully this will be a good change because I'm very excited about the, the brothers that we have uh, participating and aiding us in our worship on that Sunday. So please keep that in mind. And, uh, and if it's something you would like to see, uh, Please speak to one of our elders and share your thoughts. If you think it's from the devil, share that with them too. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they, they want to hear, uh, you know, they want feedback. So whatever, uh, however you feel about it. Now, I know that if my father finds out we're meeting at 930, he'll say we're unscriptural because you got to meet at, at the top of the hour, he thinks. Now, that's a joke that we've had, a running joke we've had for years and years. Because uh, I was preaching in a church that was... 9 30 10 30 and he was going to a nine o'clock ten o'clock church and he says you know you guys are meeting at an unscriptural time so we always had a had a big time with that uh it's a scriptural day not a scriptural time and um and so we want to we want to keep that straight would you pray with me as uh we go uh begin our lesson father we thank you so much for the blessings of this day and we're so grateful for all who've been present throughout this day to learn, to worship, and to fellowship. We thank you so much for honoring us with your presence as we come before you. As we open up another portion of your word tonight, Father, we ask you to please be with us. Give us hearts and minds capable of understanding and help us, Father, to, um, to use good sense in how we approach things in the Scripture. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. I, I teach on occasion a class. I've taught it at National School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. I've taught it in Guyana and um, it called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is the science or art of interpreting Scripture. And there are a lot of things that you need when you go to interpret Scripture. And one of the number one things that you need is the use of the good sense that God gave you. Because there's a lot of the the error that we come across in Scripture is because we don't apply common sense to, to Scripture. So it's important for us, regardless of the subject matter, to think through it thoroughly, to not have knee-jerk reactions, and, and prayerfully consider what it is that's being brought forward to us. We've, we're all the way to the end here, almost. We're, 
You know, these, um, something has gone terribly wrong with the order of the slides. There, there's not a title slide. Well, my files are corrupted. This ought to be fun. Well, because I, I, I printed off the slides, and the first slide should be a title slide, and then the second slide should be the, the questions. You see them? Is it possible that it didn't download all the slides? when I gave you the, di uh, the flash drive? There should be 14 slides. And we there it is. Okay. Outstanding. Thank you, Mark. I've messed him up twice today, so I think I owe him a, a donut or something. I don't know. Um, the, I've, I had uh, I had an old file with some from with this, the same title as I used this morning that I was pulling points from that in the new lesson that I gave this morning, and so I kept referring to it, and I didn't delete it from my flash drive, and that's the one that he put up this morning. Uh, wasn't the, the the new set and I didn't tell him differently I was too busy running my mouth to pay attention to what he was downloading this morning so I apologize to you all I've already apologized to him but I probably am going to owe him a, a nice long letter or something um, what's that beef jerky okay not a donut but beef jerky all right there's a couple of questions about head coverings that I've been asked recently by a couple of different folks um, number one what was the issue in Corinth related to head coverings? And is this an instruction that is binding for Christians today? Because that's what we've got to ask about every practice that we see in the New Testament. Why is it there, and is it binding for us today or not? For instance, we look at the, the, speak, the practice of speaking in tongues. We know that that's not an issue related to today because we do not have that gift in the same way they did. Now, we can explore that in another lesson another time, but we want to ask that with whatever it is, whether it's singing, whether it's praying, whatever the subject is, we need to examine it to see is that something that was unique to the situation in which we find it, or is that something that was to be uh, a part of Christianity throughout all time? Because our practice needs to be based on good understanding of what the scripture says. So these are our questions that we're looking at tonight. And so we want to go to 1 Corinthians because this is where our instruction um, originates. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 through 16. And I will tell you this, we're not going to touch on every one of the points in this section of scripture simply because it would take way too much time to deal with everything in depth. I want to deal specifically with the issue regarding the head covering. I will touch on a few of the other things, but primarily we want to look at that. Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. 
For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, as we look at this, there's quite a few issues, and I want us to to touch on a couple of those. The first issue is headship, this idea of headship. And basically what is being discussed here is Christ is the head of the man, and the implication here is a husband, and the, wo- the man is the head of the woman or the wife. And that is the the order of things. Now, when you look into Ephesians chapter 5, you're going to see uh, the same idea uh, in very different words, but the same concept is being brought forward here. And so there's number one, there's the idea of headship. But number two, there's the idea of covering. There's an idea of covering. Now, I see some of you guys have taken this real seriously and you've allowed all your hair to fall out. And you know who you are. <laughs> I, I told Jeff at the beginning, I said, we're not going to have any issues uh, with, with your head covering, are you? And he says, nope. He says, I'm following in the, in the steps of Elijah. And uh, if you read about Elijah, it was Elisha. Elisha. And uh, the boys were making fun of him for being an old baldy. And then a bear came out and attacked him. Yeah. So don't make fun of bald men. Let that be a lesson to us all. Okay, but this idea of covering. And is this talking about hair or is this talking about an artificial covering? These are the issues that we want to to look into. First of all, let's get the setting that we're in. In Corinth was the temple of Aphrodite. Now, when we get into some of these these cities, once you get outside of uh, Judea and Galilee and Samaria, you get into the Greco-Roman world, and the center of the city was the pagan worship, the pagan temples. When you get into that environment, you're going to find issues that are specific to those areas, the principles of which may apply outside, but the specifics are dealing with something that is happening there. Okay? Now, again, a, a, a subject for another time, but Ephesus and Corinth both had temples, one to Diana or Artemis, one to Aphrodite or Venus, depending on whether you're dealing with the Roman or the Greek side of, of those god goddesses in each of those temples they were headed by women priestesses primarily in both the writings to timothy who was the preacher at ephesus and to the church in corinth there are instructions for the women to keep silent in the church and everybody says oh well that was just cultural no it was actually counter-cultural because the cultural nature of it was that women would take the lead because men had allowed them to in those pagan worship areas. And God's idea is counter to culture. And we see that's why you have those specific things that are addressed in those particular places. So you've got the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. In this temple, as you can imagine, you're worshiping the goddess of love. And these Greek and Roman gods and goddesses were created in our own lust and image to appease the things that were for us. Now, 
in the temple of Aphrodite, you had prostitutes or priestesses who had a short hairstyle, okay? They did not have their heads shaved, but they had it shorn close, all right? That, that's what they were known as. The appearance of a woman with short hair would evoke an erotic response among those who lived in that area because their mind would immediately be drawn to the temple and the practice at the temple. Throughout the Greco-Roman world, a prostitute would be shamed by sh the shaving of her head. This was a common practice. Whenever she had done something wrong, whatever it may be, or upset the wrong person, that they would shave her head. And so you're dealing with, with that issue as well. Okay, now in Corinth, in the church, who do you think made up the church in Corinth? Well, you've got Jews and Gentiles, primarily Gentiles, because you're in a primary, primarily Gentile area. What do you think the background of those Gentiles would be if Corinth was their home? Many of them probably had gone to the temple of Aphrodite. There may even be some who were former priestesses in the temple. We don't know because we're not given a list of the backgrounds, but the church, generally speaking, is a reflection of the society in which it exists. And people are called out of the world and into the church. And it doesn't matter where they're called out from, they're called into the church, into one body, and then they are called to be holy in that environment as the church, which means even when you go outside of wherever you meet, you're still supposed to have that propriety about you of holiness. The church in Corinth existed side by side, so to speak, with the pagan worship of Aphrodite. From the text in 1 Corinthians, it appears that women or wives were coming to services with a short hairstyle. They were sh shorn. Now, many of you may not know who Beyonce is. I don't know. She's a popular singer right now. Um, she dresses in scantily clad clothes. She's a singer-dancer. She's very popular in pop circles. I can't even tell you one song that she sings, but I know her when I see her. Would you allow your daughter to dress like Beyonce and come to church services? You wouldn't. Why? Well, it, it'd be inappropriate, number one. But number two, what are you doing? You're bringing the, ch the world into the church. And you're causing people's minds not to glorify God, but to be focused on worldly things. Hey, so these ladies... Uh, women, as they are described here, and by the way, the word women and wives is an identical word in the Greek language. The context has to determine that for us. Okay? For a woman or a wife to have her hair cut short in Corinth would be highly disrespectful to her husband. It would be in rebellion to her husband and thus, when we go back to the headship issue we discussed at the opening, she would be in rejection to or rebellion of the headship that had been established by God. That, that would be the indication for that particular action. It, it would be the sign of rebellion. It would be, it would cause non-Christians to question in their own mind In Corinth, whenever someone saw a woman with shorn hair, everyone in Corinth knew who that woman was. If they saw these women with shorn hair, 
going to the place that everyone knew was where the Christians met, what do you think that would do to the reputation of the church? Because then everybody's thinking, oh, well, they're just transferring the worship from Aphrodite over here to the church. Because that's, that would be the appearance of what was taking place. This would create a disunity in the assembly as well. Because then there would be conflict among members. I would go to Chris, why did you let your wife come in like that? Why did you let your daughter come in like that? Don't you know how disrespectful that is? And, you know, oh, you know, she's okay, and now we're having this, this tussle about us. Now remember, the Corinthian letter is written by Paul to a church in answer to questions they had submitted to him about things that were happening in the church there. Now let's get to the issue of the covering itself. When you look at verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Hair is the suggested covering by the Apostle Paul in the natural sense. I want to come over here for just a second. I want to talk about not the objective part of this, but the subjective part of this. If, if I gave a piece of paper to everybody in here, and I asked everyone to, without anybody else's input, to write down what is the definition of short hair and what is the definition of long hair, we would get as many definitions as you have people because it is a subjective term, long, okay? Short, okay? So you look at Jenny. Jenny's hair is not all the way to her shoulder. Some would call that short but it's a lot longer than mine, and so what are we comparing it to? And yours isn't as short as Sue's hair is. So, I mean, so which one is short? Well, there depends on how you look at it. So these are, these are subjective terms. So when you see long and short, please bear that in mind, okay? Please bear that in mind. Because we do not have a biblical definition, okay, this is long hair, this is short hair. There's no book, chapter, and verse that, des that defines for us what those terms mean. So we have to be very careful in how we apply those terms, especially in the sense of judgment. Veils were also commonly worn throughout the Old and New Testament times, both within and without the religious setting. Ruth is said to have carried uh, a bushel in her veil. So we're talking about a veil that was pretty good size. And, and if you pay much attention to the culture of the Middle East and, and you see the ladies who still wear the head covering and the veils today, you know, it's a single cloth and it covers their head and then they wrap it all the way around. And I mean, it's a lengthy, wide piece of fabric. Now, I have gone into a church where, you know the little paper doily that's in the, the tray right here? They have those at the door for the ladies to put on their head. I, I mean, I've, I've been to, that, to those churches before. And, you know, it's just a little doily. It's not an actual covering. It's just a little piece of paper that goes on their head. But to them, they believe they're fulfilling what the Scripture says. Okay, so we've got to understand that the veil was not just a religious, but it was also an everyday thing that women would wear in certain places for certain reasons, both religious and cultural. There were in some um, cultures that a woman who was a virgin could not show her face in public. And that's still that way in some Muslim cultures today. Only her eyes could show, and in some cultures, only one eye could show back during that day. So you see, even among the ancients, 
they were not in total agreement as to what was to be done. So when we look at, at 1116, at the end of the discussion, Paul writes, but if anyone seems to be contentious, contentious about what? About the issue regarding the covering of the head. Men uncovered, women covered. We have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. This seems to indicate that the instruction that is offered here is given directly to the church at Corinth for a specific situation. Now remember how I said we have to, to look into was this intended to be through all time? Was this intended to be temporary or was this intended to be just for a specific location and not for every location? And you've got to do that with every issue in the New Testament. We, we've got to be smart in how we apply these things. This seems to be exclusively to the church in Corinth. Because Paul says that neither he, and he uses the, uh, the uh, accommodative word we, Paul nor the churches had any such custom. The word custom there seems to refer to a practice or a tradition. So the other churches did not have the custom or the tradition that he is, is instructing them in here. Now, what does nature tell us? Nature tells us that the beauty of a woman is in her hair and that a man should not reflect the same look as a woman has. By nature there, what does that mean? What do you do with a woman who's, who loses her hair? My great-grandmother was uh, almost bald when she was 80 years old. She had such thin hair. And nature had done that to her. Some men have a big, thick head of hair. Some men don't. Some women's hair is very thick and long and, and lovely, and, and other women sit there and they, they wish their hair looked like that. What we've got to understand is when it talks about nature, nature tells us that men should be men and women should be women. And whatever we're dealing with within a culture, we want to act properly within that culture. When, when my ladies go to Guyana with me, whether it's my wife, whether it's a teenage girl like uh, Nice Wonger's daughter, whether it's my nurses, one of which was 70 years old on this last trip, I tell them, it's okay to wear pants there. But in the services, you need to wear a dress. You don't have to wear anything fancy, you know, just one of those skirts down to the ankle, especially the ones that you can just kind of twist up and throw in your suitcase. Those are great. They're lightweight fabric, they're cool, they're comfortable, but they're also modest, and modesty is the big thing. And we don't want to in any way be a stumbling block to the people in that culture when we're there trying to help them. Is there a book, chapter, and verse that women have to wear dresses? No. <coughs> I know that there was a big argument about 50 years ago in the church about women wearing pants. But I, I, I can't wear a pair of women's pants. They're not cut for me because I'm a man. Women's pants are cut and made for women. Um, if, if I was trying to wear women's clothing and women were trying to wear men's clothing, then we might have some issues to talk about when it comes to attire. Um, however, that's not the issue. The issue is modesty, propriety. Those are the issues. And a woman can wear a dress and be immodest, and she can wear pants and be modest. I think we've all seen examples of that. 
So we've got to understand customs when we're dealing with certain things as well. But there was no custom outside of the church in Corinth. Now, when we talk about our application to this, and then we're going to talk about conscience in just a moment, but let's talk about application. We need to be very careful as Christians with any customs or trends because everything we do should bring glory and honor to God. And so if we're following the trends of the world, whatever it may be, whether it's our hairstyle, whether it's how we dress, any of those things, and we're bringing the world's custom into the church, we need to be very careful about that. Now, I want to talk to you about custom for just a minute. I'm the only guy here with a tie on, right? So who's right, me or you? Jimmy's right. <laughs> Do you know how ties came into existence? you know what the, the origin of the tie is? It's French. You know what it was used for? It was tied around the ponytail of a man's powdered wig to hold it on his head. And then they would tie it around their neck so it would hold their wig in place. And it became a fashion statement. And now I'm wearing a tie. 300 plus years later. Okay? I think they look really nice. I like ties. I've never heard anybody complain because a preacher wore a tie, but I've heard them complain when he didn't. And I'm taking that stumbling block out of the way. That, that's why I dress like I do. Because I don't want anybody complaining because I'm too casual and I don't take my job seriously because of the way I dress. All right? I don't think, personally, that a preacher has to wear a coat and a tie. It, I, I don't believe that. I don't think Jesus owned a tie. Okay? Imagine the Apostle Paul didn't own a tie. But for me, it would bother me if I didn't. It doesn't bother me to sit and listen to a man preach that's not wearing a tie. But it does some people. And that's why you will see me wear a tie when I'm preaching. Morning and night. I don't want anything to get in the way of what I'm doing. And if my attire would get in the way of what I'm doing, then that would disturb me and it wouldn't bring glory to God. So that's why I do what I do. We need to be careful with customs or trends because they should always glorify God. Men and women both should not defy the proper customs of their place and time should not defy the proper customs of their place and time. Now, as crazy as the world is out there, we still know the, the difference between decent and indecent. Okay? It, it is not indecent to wear blue jeans. Okay? But there are some blue jeans that can be pretty indecent. I've seen blue jeans now that people are paying a lot of money for and there's less jean and more see-through because it's just a few strings holding them together and there's a little bit of denim down the side, right? There's nothing wrong with wearing a pair of slacks. There's nothing wrong with wearing a dress. There's nothing wrong with a woman wearing a shirt or wearing a blouse. None of those things matter. What matters is propriety. We're not creating a problem for someone else by the way that we dress. And that applies both to men and women. Now, when it comes to our consciences, Romans 14, in the chapter of opinions and preferences, chapter 14, verse 19 says, therefore, let us pursue peace and the things whereby we may edify one another. The church that I went into that had the little paper doilies that looked like they fit inside of the, the bread tray for the communion, <clears throat> you know what I didn't do? I didn't go in there and I didn't chastise them. I didn't tell them they were wrong. I didn't tell them that they were only following the cultural norm that was to be applied to the Corinthian church. Do you know why? Because their conscience was telling them that they needed to do this. 
and what they were doing in no way inhibited me from worshiping my God. I have not been to a one cup persuasion church. But if I ever walked into a church where there was one cup up there, I would not tell them that they're doing that wrong. Their consciences are telling them that they need to use one cup when they share in the supper. I would never want them to violate their conscience. I would be happy to have a discussion with them on the subject, should they choose to do so. But I don't want to fight. I'm not going to fight over how many cups we use. The point is this. If someone is bothered in their conscience by coming in to a house of worship to sing, to pray, and to participate in worship. If a lady feels that she needs to have her head covered, whether with a hat, a veil, or even a paper doily, like what's in, in this right here, by all means, she should do that and not violate her conscience. And no one else should tell her any differently. This is such an important matter. And it's not the matter of the head covering I'm talking about. I'm talking about how we treat one another in our preferences. Because you would not want to have to violate your conscience in order to worship, would you? The, the reason I have been to places that uh, worship with uh, instruments and I, I can't sing with them. Been invited somewhere and they're, they're using instruments. And I can't sing because that violates my conscience to sing with those instruments. But I'm not going to create a stir. I'm not going to make a scene. If they would like to have a discussion about that at another time, I would be very happy to have a discussion with them and study the Bible with them about that. But I cannot. If you went and it didn't violate your conscience, even though you, you are not going to practice that yourself, if it didn't violate your conscience to sing, then by all means sing. I can't. I'm going to tell you right now, I can't sing with the instrument, praises to God. And I'm not going to violate my conscience. It's important. Because for him who knows to do good and he does not do it, what does James tell us? To him it is sin. And for a person to violate their conscience, it would be a, a sin situation for them. We do not want to cause a problem for folks. If you ever go into a church <coughs> and they are a head covering, and there are churches of Christ all over the country that the ladies wear head coverings. And they believe that it's a matter of faith. They don't believe it's a matter of conscience. They believe it's a matter of faith. If you go in there, ladies, by all means, accept the offer of a head covering and put it on or either don't stay. Do not rebel. Do not cause them to stumble. It's not going to cost you a thing to do that and to show respect. Because to be disrespectful would not bring honor and glory to God. We, we need to make sure that we pursue peace and the things whereby we may build one another up, edify one another. That is the key principle when we're dealing with issues about which we may disagree. And, and I'm thankful that this congregation is not a congregation that creates a stink about stuff like that. I'm very thankful. I, um, I grew up in the 1970s. I was a teenager in the 70s. And I've always had really nice thick hair. Well, the 1970s, and you guys can just be jealous if you want to, those of you guys that are, are Elishas in our crowd. But in the 1970s, I liked to grow my hair out, much to the chagrin of my lieutenant colonel 
father. I had hair down below my shoulder. I liked it. I didn't look like a woman, but I had long hair. I didn't wear it in the style of a woman, but I had long hair. What I would consider long hair, but you know what? It wasn't as long as some people I've seen. And again, we go back to the word long and short. Until I was in about the second grade, my dad cut my hair. Because he didn't want to pay a quarter for his boys to get a haircut, so he bought a $10 barber kit that he never really figured out how to use correctly. And he would cut our heads. But he buzzed us. There's a picture of my brother and I in our Sears and Roebuck crested jackets. And I'm sitting there, and my brother is between my legs, sitting there like this, and we're looking there, smiling all big with a fresh haircut. And I've got a bald spot right here on top of my head. I say all that to say this. The length of your hair is not important. The length of your heart is what's important. And if you believe that it's a problem between you and God and it's a problem between you and your brethren because of your hair, then by all means do something about it. Grow it out, cover it up, cut it off, whatever it may be. But don't look down and despise someone because their hair might be different than yours. And their beliefs regarding their conscience might be different than yours. It all comes back to loving one another as God in Christ has loved us. That is the critical part of this whole thing. And if we love each other in the sacrificial way that God loved us through his son Jesus Christ, then we're not going to have issues like this that create division between us. We're going to love each other. We're going to encourage each other. And I can't imagine a better way to live as the body of Christ than in a loving and encouraging way. The world is tearing us down bit by bit, piece by piece. It is around every corner trying to cut our legs out from under us. We by no means should be doing that to our brethren. Somebody's got to prop each other up. We've got to love each other. And let's not allow preferences, whether of conscience or whether somebody has a, a different view of an interpretation of Scripture. Let's not allow that to be a force of division in the body of Christ. Tonight, maybe you've been thinking about the lesson this morning. Maybe you've think, been thinking about something you were studying this last week. Or maybe this afternoon something else has come upon your heart. And you need prayers. You want encouragement from your brothers and sisters. Maybe you're dealing with a relationship issue. You're dealing with a sickness. Some other form of discouragement. Whatever it may be. Let us pray with you and pray for you tonight. Let us encourage you tonight. Or if you're here and you've never named the name of Christ. You've never put him on baptism. Won't you let us help you with that tonight as well. Whatever your need is, won't you please make it known to us as together we stand and as we sing.